9th of June 2021 Kingdom of Stone by Pastor Simon James Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you tonight. We trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting and may you be receptive to the voice of the Blessed Holy Spirit. Riverside Tabernacle is an online Christian ministry committed to preaching the truth about Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask you for your blessing tonight as we listen to your word. Father, as I sit here and speak to your children as a mouthpiece of, for God tonight, I pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. And Holy Spirit, I ask you that you'll enlighten our minds, illuminate our thoughts, that we will understand what you want us to learn. Father, we ask these mercies in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus, with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Daniel and his three friends were in prayer. It was still early in the day and the young men had gathered in Daniel's quarters to worship as was their custom. They had scarcely recited the Ten Commandments when the door burst open and soldiers rushed into the room. They were grabbed roughly and hauled outside. The king has ordered that all the wise men be killed, said Ariok, the chief executioner, standing across the courtyard. His voice was harsh, but his face was pale, even sad, as if for once he didn't enjoy his job as the executioner. Daniel asked, Commander Ariok, may I speak with you? He nodded and Daniel walked over to him. Ariok confirmed the decree of death. Why? asked Daniel. All the wise men of Babylon could not tell the king his dream or interpret it, he said. Not all, said Daniel. Stay the execution until I have spoken to the king. Daniel knew that his God did not bring him to Babylon to die at the whim of a foreign king. Nebuchadnezzar saw Daniel and realized he had not consulted his wisest advisor. Speak, Belteshazzar. Daniel bowed and said, O king, live forever. I request but one day to learn your dream and its interpretation. Granted, said Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel hurried to tell Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of his audience with the king. We have one day to answer the king in the matter of his dream, he said. The men looked at each other. They knew what had to be done. In unison, they knelt down to pray. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 45, uh, 44 and 45. And in, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left for another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Tonight we are speaking about kingdom of stone. And some of you will know the story. It's a story of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, when King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of a statue. And the statue was actually a dream that when interpreted correctly, told him, told Daniel, and tells us today what is to come. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a large statue of a man. The statue had a head of gold. It had a breast and arms. Its breast and arms were of silver. It had a belly and thighs of brass and legs of iron. The feet and toes were odd though. They were of iron mixed with clay, a very odd combination. The dream troubled the king. He could not sleep. You see, the king had been worried about his kingdom. He knew that he would not live forever. For weeks he had lain upon his bed at night, pondering the future of Babylon. Fatigue this night closed his eyelids, and Yahweh, 
the God of heaven sent him a dream, a puzzling dream. He urgently called his trusted advisor, the Chaldeans. He asked for the dream and its interpretation. It was a, diff it was a difficult assignment. Normally somebody, a soothsayer or a Chaldean or an astrologer or a magician was told a dream and then asked for interpretation. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't like other kings. He was different from his father and his grandfather. He was different from the other kings that had ruled Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the first king who started a university and included in that university exiles from the countries that he conquered. And now he did something also that was quite unique, something extraordinary. He wanted to test his magicians, his astrologers, his advisors to see and know if they were truly in contact with the spiritual world as claimed, if they were truly in contact with God as they claimed to be. Tell us the dream, king, and we will interpret. He refused flatly. If they were what he claimed, if they were truly wise men, if they were men who had contact with God, if they were the oracles of God, they would know the dream and its interpretation. And he refused to tell them the interpretation. And when they couldn't tell, him, couldn't tell him the interpretation because they kept insisting and they said to him, King, nobody on earth can do this because the gods do not dwell among men. And the king was furious. He called Arioch, the chief executioner, and he said, Kill all the wise men of Babylon, every one of them from the, high, from the greatest to the least. And Arioch rushed off with his band of soldiers to round them all up so he could kill them. And then when they came to pick Daniel and his friends up, Daniel and his friends who had not known about this, they weren't consulted. They were quite young men at the time. Although the king was impressed with the intelligence, he didn't think it wise to ask them. And when Daniel asked Arioch, Arioch said to him, this is... What happened? The king had a dream. It was a recurring dream. It was like a vision. It troubled the king. He woke up in a sweat. And he wants to know the interpretation of his dream. But whoever tells him the interpretation needs to tell him the dream. Because he doesn't want inter an interpretation based on human thought. He wants an interpretation which is given by God. And Daniel asks Ariok to give him some time. He says, don't kill anybody yet. Let me talk to the king. Take me to the king. And Ariok went to the king and he said, I found a man who says he can do this. And the king gave Daniel more time. And Daniel came back to his friends. And he told them this. And these students had what was probably the first university student prayer meeting. Now Daniel and his friends had a hum humanly impossible task. To a human being this was an impossible task. To the magicians in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, it was an impossible task. Not only did they have to interpret the dream, they had to know the dream and retell it to the king initially. First tell him the dream and then tell him the interpretation. The boys spent the day asking their God for the answer. And that night, the Lord God of heaven, Yahweh is his name, gave Daniel the answer in a night vision. You see, God had heard the prayers of these four boys. And when they called upon him, he answered. He answered the prayer and he gave Daniel the dream and the interpretation in a night vision. I do not know if an angel visited him. We do not know if Daniel saw the dream as a vision or he dreamed the same dream. But Daniel knew that he knew when he knew the answer. They praised the God of heaven and Daniel went to the king to tell him the interpretation. He was ready to tell the king that, the, that Yahweh, the revealer, the revealer of mysteries, the God of the Bible who is the revealer of mysteries, had told him the dream and the interpretation thereof. And King Nebuchadnezzar was for, in for a great surprise.
probably the greatest surprise of his life, for he was about to speak with a true oracle of God. The interpretation was this. Nebuchadnezzar was the king. The, the kingdom of gold was Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold. And then Daniel told the king that after him there will be another kingdom inferior to his. But it, that kingdom will rise. And that is the kingdom of silver. The chest and the arms of that statue. And then he said a third kingdom will rise. A kingdom of bronze. And then a kingdom of iron. And after the kingdom of iron there would be a kingdom of of iron mixed with clay and then there would be disasters a disaster for the earthly kingdoms a stone that the king saw in his dream a stone was cut out from a mountainside a rock was cut out from a mountainside not with human hands but by divine hands by intervention God had cut out in the, in, the, in the king's dream, a large rock. And this stone came flying towards the great statue as if it had a life of its own. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay. And the statue disintegrated and blew away as chaff blows in the wind. And the stone became a mountain it grew and fill the whole earth. It became a divine kingdom. And the only kingdom that survived. Nothing was seen of the kingdoms of the past. You see this kingdom. The kingdom of the stone had the power to destroy any kingdom before it. Not just to destroy it. But to obliterate it. To eliminate it. To rid it. Rid the world of it totally. And this is a kingdom that we are going to speak about today. Or tonight, the kingdom of stone is not a kingdom established by men, but by the true God. It is a kingdom that Jesus spoke about. For Jesus is that stone, and this is his kingdom. <clears throat> the king was excited that Daniel had interpreted his dream. He rewarded Daniel handsomely as he had promised. And he stayed the execution of the other astrologers and advisors. Daniel was placed in the, at the court of the king. The king wanted Daniel, a young man, who went right past his, the older men of that palace, the older advisors. Daniel sat next to the king, right next to the king so he could advise the king. And at Daniel, Daniel's request, he promoted his three intercessory friends. Again, a reminder that God sets up and God deposes. God's men were now in charge of Babylon. It is Jehovah God who sets up kings and disposes them and deposes them. It is he who sets up rulers. It is he who brings down rulers. He chose to reveal the secrets of the future of this world to a Gentile king for reasons of his own. 3,000 years ago, God told this king through Daniel, what was going to come to pass in the end days. And he told him about the kingdoms. And he told him in the last days that there would be a kingdom that is made up of clay and iron. And it is that kingdom that we are facing today. The book of Daniel contains many prophecies of the end time with the purpose of preparing us for the future. We need to understand that tonight, that the book of Daniel contains prophecies not for us just to read and say, wow, that is so true, but for us to prepare us, ourselves, for the future. There is a future coming, and God warned us 3,000 years ago. He, he gave us the warning even before His Son was born on this earth as a man, because God was showing us that there will be a day when out of heaven, out of the mountainside, a stone will come to this earth. And that is Jesus. And the kingdom of Jesus will destroy every other earthly kingdom that rises against it. And his kingdom will endure forever. It is eternally enduring. The kingdoms we speak about, the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom or Babylonian 
empire, as I said. And after that came the, the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. History will tell you that the Medo-Persian Empire succeeded the Babylonian Empire. And that was represented by the silver chest and arms. And then the bronze belly and thighs where the Greek was, was the Greek Empire. And then the legs of iron. That was Alexander the Great. And then the legs of iron represented the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was still ruling when the Lord Jesus came. And the kingdom of iron and clay is the present world government. It is a loose arrangement of the countries in Europe. Mainly the European Union. There may be other countries as well. Theologians call it the revived Roman Empire. When you read the Bible, that is the term they gave it. The revived Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that was and seemed to have been totally destroyed. But it reached into Europe. It reached into London. They had... Uh, they had a center in London, a Roman uh, capital in London. They were throughout the, the European countries. That kingdom is reforming. It is reviving. And that kingdom will revive again. And when that kingdom revives, out of that kingdom will come the Antichrist. European royalty can be traced to their Roman family roots. If you care to do the research, you'll find that almost all the European and Russian royalty are related and the Greeks and they all come from the same Roman roots. This kingdom that we're talking about is a kingdom that is made up of treaties that, that are easily broken. That is why it is iron mixed with clay. It is not a monolithic kingdom like Babylon was or the Medo-Persians or the Greeks. It is a kingdom that is loosely joined by common purpose when it suits them. The treaties are made to be broken. This is a kingdom that will still be ruling when Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes to take us home. The stone that was cut out from the side of the mountain represents the kingdom of God. And when Jesus returns, he will destroy the ruling one world government and set up his heavenly kingdom. And that heavenly kingdom will endure forever and ever. It's the kingdom of stone. This is not a biblical term. I'm using it as a catchphrase because Jesus is referred to as the living stone. We are living in a time when a one world government is becoming increasingly attractive. People are looking for a savior. What the world is looking for is a sociopolitical, a sociopolitical savior political savior. They are looking for somebody who will save them from the social ills, from the political ills, bring them together, unite Israel and her enemies and create a peace. But as clay and iron cannot mix, that peace will be temporary. That peace will be temporary and the Antichrist will show his face. He will rear his head. When there is a huge following, a falling away from God, we are living in a time of apostasy. In a time when many people think there's going to be great revivals. And yes, there are revivals happening. But overall in the general Christian fraternity, people are falling away from God. They are getting cold. The love of many, the Bible says, will wax cold. And they will drift away from God. And people are drifting away from God because they cannot face God because sin cannot stand in the presence of God and the world is advocating for a more sinful world because sin is subjective and sin is now accepted. What is wrong is now called right and what is right is now called wrong. If you read the papers, if you listen to the newscasts and if you, if you think about it for a minute, you'll find that the world is heading in a totally different way, a totally different direction from what we thought it would be. It is heading for disaster. There's no morality has gone out the window. Morality is subjective. Whatever works for me, works for me. Even the gender identity, identity crisis in the world or debate. You can be called whatever you want to, to be called. You can find a man who considers himself a woman is allowed to walk into a bathroom where there are women and female children. 
and you cannot stop him because what he believes he is, is what you've got to accept him to be. This is unheard. This was unheard of, but it is the way it is today. There is a rejection of all that is mor morally right. There is a rejection of the word of God. And accept the Lord return quickly. We will all go that way. And it's in this time that the stone that the builders have rejected will return to become the cornerstone of the kingdom of stone. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the kingdom of stone. Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my angels would fight for it. He said, are there not legions of angels at my disposal? Or at my father's disposal? If I ask the father, he'll send legions of angels to rescue me. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, he was referring to his kingdom. The kingdom of stone. The kingdom of stone. That is coming down. The kingdom that will culminate in the marriage feast of the Lamb. And then the white throne judgment and the, and the descending of the new Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem will be gone. And new Jerusalem will take its place. Take its place. We are in the last days. I warn you tonight. We are in the last days. We are in the days just before the Lord Jesus returns. Don't kid yourself that we have a lot of time. There are many pastors and preachers who are saying, we are not in the last days. We are just at the beginning of the birth pangs. And yes, I tell them this, that birth pangs are part of the birth. And don't kid yourself that you've got a lot of time to decide. Tomorrow may be too late. You have to decide on Jesus now. Because when Jesus returns, time will cease. Time of grace will cease. We do not have a lot of time. Jesus is coming soon. We have a choice to, be, to, to make. Either be citizens of this world, of these kingdoms, the, the revived Roman Empire, which we'll all be forced to become members of because we'll have a one world government with, with one citizenship. We'll be a world citizen. Or we can be citizens of the kingdom of stone. And this is our passport to the kingdom of stone. Human enterprises decline as time goes on. The things that men want to do, the things that men do, the things that men achieve decline as time goes on. Time is the leveler. Time is the great leveler. Time destroys everything. Time makes you forget everything. So whatever you've achieved, whatever these kings like Nebuchadnezzar and, and Darius and Belshazzar and, and Alexander the Great and the Roman uh, generals and, and, and kings and uh, governors achieved have all been forgotten. They are just history. We call it history. Very few of us really study it. But our enterprises, human enterprises decline as time goes on. And the kingdom of iron and clay is a union that appears strong. But indeed it is weak. When we look at how the, the world is forming alliances, we find that even countries that would never form an alliance previously are forming alliances. And the, this kingdom is based on mutual benefits. I will scratch your back if you scratch mine. I want something from you, so that's why I want to be your friend. And as soon as it's inconvenient for me to be your friend, I will turn against you. But it also shows me a deeper, a deeper iron and clay mixing. We are called iron because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. This kingdom of iron and clay reminds me or, or indicates to me that there is also a compromise, an unhealthy compromise between Christians and the world. We are the iron, the world is the clay and we are forming an alliance with them. We are compromising and the kingdom will unite against the kingdom of the world will unite against a common enemy. Yes, not our common enemy, but their common enemy, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ stands for everything that the secular world hates. Jesus Christ 
is love. The secular world preaches about love, but they don't show it. How can you love someone when you kill babies that, can't, that aren't even born? How can you love, say you love, when you kill people just because they belong to another religion? An antichrist will rule over this kingdom and he will gather the armies of the world in the plains of Armageddon to fight against the Lord. And this kingdom of the world is being set up right now, the revived Roman Empire. Britain and many of the other European countries belong to this empire. So are many other countries. Every country in the world will have to decide. And when you look at what is happening, you will find that Israel, the people of God, will stand alone. Not only will, the Bible says, when Israel sees themselves being encompassed by the armies of the enemy, they must know that the time of the Lord is at hand. And it is being revived. It will eventually come against the people of God, against Israel and the church. The people of God are Israel, physical Israel, and the church of God. The kingdom of iron and clay has started to persecute children of God already. When you look at it, no more are we allowed to preach like we used to. We got to be careful what we say. And many pastors are so scared of this that they won't say what is, said, is supposed to be said. We, don't, we are too afraid to call sin, sin. Because in this, in this socially tolerant world, anything goes. The only thing they're intolerant about is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can no more say that Jesus is the only way to God. You've got to go on to television programs and put your tail between your legs and say, there might be other ways. No, I say there is only one way. They could put me in jail for this, but Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ, the stone, the rock, the chief cornerstone, the living stone, and the spiritual rock. These are all terms that the Lord is referred to in the Bible. And that is why I termed my uh, sermon tonight, the kingdom of stone. We are talking about the kingdom of the rock, the kingdom of the chief cornerstone, the kingdom of the living stone, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The statue, the statue that was built represents man's ambition to overthrow God. Do you remember the Tower of Babel? Why did they build a tower? It was built in defiance of God. They thought that this time if God decides to destroy the world with a flood, they would have been too be high enough to, to ride out the flood. Ever since man has been building towers and statues, man builds towers to show his success. He builds statues to celebrate his success in his pride. What do people do when they're successful? They build tall buildings and they put their names on it. It's a symbol of success built in pride. Go out throughout the countries of the world and you will see countries are trying to build the tallest building. There's a building that will be a kilometer into the sky. 1,000 odd meters up into the sky. When you're up there, the clouds, you might be right in the clouds. You see statues celebrate the achievements. Tall buildings shout to the world, we've done something, we've accomplished much. And that was the syndrome of Babel. Perhaps that is why God sent a dream of a statue to Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar was the king of kings. He was referred to in his time as the king of kings. He was the greatest of all kings. He ruled the greatest of all empires. But he was a proud man. And if you carry on reading the book of Daniel, you'll find that God humbled him. I won't go back into that. I've mentioned it before. God had to humble him to show him that who's God? Who did who sets up rulers and who destroys them. And we have all experienced the pride of man. The pride of man is rather than give God praise for creation. They attribute creation to a cosmic accident. You and I are considered to be a cosmic accident. We are considered to be something that just happened 
out of nothing we are created. Yes, we were created out of nothing. We were just created out of the word of God. But God didn't use any materials. He just made us. He made the earth and then he took clay and he made us. But these people say that there was nothing and then there was some, there was everything. They do not want to give credit for the agency of creation to God. According to them, God did not create. According to them, God does not exist. You see, God is an inconvenient truth. God is an inconvenient truth to this world. Scientists have taken science and made science the God. They believe that we came out as a cosmic accident when something happened, some atom exploded. Where did the atom come from? The great Stephen Hawking said he can explain creation because as long as he can explain creation without a God, because as long as there is a force of gravity, things can be created. I beg to ask him, he's dead now, but someone should have asked him, where did the gravity come from? You see, there is a force behind such theories, such theories that that are that are atheist that say there is no God that take God's credit away and give it to somebody to something else. That force is the kingdom of the devil. That force is the devil. The devil doesn't want the God of the Bible to be worshipped. He will do anything. He will come up with any theory. To say there is no God of the Bible. To say that this word of God has been made up. It is made up. We know that it is in the inspired word of God. Because God in, in sundry times has spoken to us through his prophets. And these men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Mankind. Has rejected its creator. Mankind has rejected its creator. We are, we are worse than a child who disowns his or her parents. We have rejected the creator of life. We owe it all to God. But yet we show him our finger. Education and achievements, accomplishments have made mankind proud. And mankind has forgotten that it, is a, that it is our God that gives the ability to live, to learn, to achieve, to succeed. God lifts up and he sets down. Man needs a renewal of mind. Like the writer of Hebrews says. We need a renewal of our mind. It is our mind, it is our reason that has let us down. We have allowed our reason to fly off at a tangent and we are following it or into space not realizing that we are way off target we have left God because God is not convenient it's not convenient to be a Christian it's not convenient to be a child of God let me not say Christian but let me say a true child of God because the thing that things that God wants you to do you have better things to do the things that God doesn't want you to do those are the things you want to do. So God is not convenient. Now the stone that struck the statue grew. It became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The kingdom of God will push out every other kingdom of the world. Right now God is allowing the devil to do his little dance. He's only allowing it. In his wisdom he's allowed that. And it's a test for us. Filling the whole earth means that this kingdom will be the only kingdom. The whole earth will be one kingdom under God. And we will be restored to the days of Eden. The pre-sin days. To me and hopefully to you, Jesus is the rock of ages that was cleft for us. In that cleft we can hide from the ravages of this earthly government. We just heard about. We've been going through. The COVID pandemic. We lost a whole year of our life. When we think back. There's nothing to remember about it. 
except for those of our loved ones who have died, we have died. And now we find that the governments colluded and created this. There is strong evidence suggesting, and I'm not saying I'm not saying either way it's true or false, but that is what's happening. So if that can happen, and if that is proven true in a court of law, or if it's proven true, what can we say about trusting those that rule over us? But the Lord Jesus Christ will never do something like that to you. God is sovereign. Nebuchadnezzar needed to understand that God was sovereign. That God knew what was, is, and what was going to happen. God knew what happened. And God knew what was, what's happening at the moment. God is omniscient. He knows the past, he knows the future, he knows the present. God lives in the eternal present. He is in control of history. He sets up rulers and deposes them. Nebuchadnezzar needed to know that. Nebuchadnezzar was proud thinking that he had achieved all his achievements, all his winnings, all the lands that he had conquered and taken over. He thought he'd done it himself. This dream was to remind him that it wasn't him. It was God. God allowed him to, to rule. And God could remove him at any time. And in the next chapter, or in chapter 4 at least, God shows him that. And God removes him. It's, if you read chapter 3 and 4, you will see how proud he was and how God just took everything away from him. He knows the future. God knows the future. God knows the past. He lives in eternal presence. Present. God is not responsible for wickedness, but he can overrule wickedness to achieve his divine purposes. God doesn't do wicked things, but he can overrule the wickedness and to achieve his, his divine purposes. Human enterprise is always in danger of, if, of crashing. History has shown that mankind has, that has progressed to a point or progresses to a point and then collapses. Nothing made by man endures. It all falls to be replaced by something else. Everyone dies to be replaced by someone else. Today I am here preaching. Tomorrow there might be somebody else. Progress and improvement all give way to decay and decline. Everything fades away. The world seems as strong as iron, but it is as weak as clay. It does not hold together for long. We are promised, we are promised peace in this world, by this world, but we never see it. And even the one, the peace that we will see during the time of tribulation will be a temporary truce. Man at best is clay, made of dust. Only what is of God will remain and flourish. All else fades away. God has purposed that Jesus will return and will destroy all his enemies once and for all. He will establish his kingdom or re-establish his kingdom and it will endure eternally. All the kingdom, all the great kingdoms of the past, the present, the future will disappear as a vapor when the Son of God arises. God has, God has everything in control as supreme, sovereign being over the universe. Our hope is not in governments, in law, in political alliances, moral campaigns. Or good works, personal or corporate. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in you tonight is the hope of glory. The hope of a brighter, everlasting future in the kingdom of God where we have no need of the sun. My illustration for tonight is called The Rolling Rock. Rudyard Kipling wrote a beautiful novel called Kim. It was about a little uh, Irish boy in, living in India named Kimball and that's where Kim comes from. In it there's a scene where Kim and his colleague uh, the, the, the Lama or the Dalai Lama of that time are being pursued by a horde of bandits and they have a few men with them. In the chase they manage to make it to the top of a mountain and from there they have a visual advantage over the horde of bandits that's approaching. However, the enemy is way too strong for them, both in numbers and firepower. Soon it is obvious that capture or death is inevitable. 
The enemy sense the victory and they sense it is near and they start shooting at these people. It seems just a matter of time before Kim and his companions are shot. They hide behind a rock. And as the bullets whiz past their heads, Kim and his colleagues realize they have little chance against the marauding bandits. They shoot back with the few guns they have and soon they have spent all their ammunition. Now the bandits just have to climb up and capture them. But war is the mother of invention, they say, and one of the fugitives comes up with a novel plan to use their height advantage. The huge rock they are standing behind is exactly between them and their enemies. Using the empty rifles, they start to lever the huge boulder. They put their, rock, their, their rifles beneath it and they push it on it as a lever. Fear fuels their strength and the adrenaline pumps through their body and at last the rock starts to budge and then move. They hear the enemy closing in when suddenly the rock gives way and with a mighty heave it starts rolling down the mountain. The bandits realize the danger too late. The rolling rock sets off a chain reaction as hundreds of rocks start rolling down towards the enemy. When the sound dies and the dust settles, only Kim and his companions are still standing. And that is how it is with us. We hide from our enemies behind this rock, this king, this stone kingdom, this, this living stone. We hide behind him. Jesus is our rock of refuge. When we hide behind him, we are protected from our enemies. And when Jesus rolls, the enemy perishes. I conclude with this. In Mark 1.15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The living stone, Jesus, proclaimed that the time of his kingdom was close. Now that was almost 2,000 years ago. So how much closer would his kingdom be now? There is no more prophecy that precedes the rapture that is not fulfilled. We are at the time when we can truly say, look up for your redemption is, is near. Nebuchadnezzar was told the future. I'm not sure if he understood it totally as Daniel did. Daniel knew. You have no excuse. I have told you today what it means. The kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome are all in the past. They've all gone down the sands of time. This is the time of the revived Roman Empire, which will see its prime during Antichrist's reign. But even it won't last when Jesus comes to defeat Antichrist and the beast and establish his kingdom of stone. I trust that you have enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. To learn more about this ministry, visit our website, riversidetabernacle.com. Use the links provided there to access our YouTube channel and Facebook page. You may also use the social media links provided to log your prayer or counseling requests. Remember, we are live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10 a.m., God willing. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.